Have we reached the end of the American globalist empire? The world feels pretty strange at the moment. We have battles popping up all over the place. Geopolitics is something that I think a lot of people thought they could ignore, and now it's knocking at their door. Our guest today is an expert in this area, and I've actually been lucky enough to be on his show several times. Hervoye Morich is the host of a great show on TNT Radio, and he also runs geopoliticsandempire.com. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today, my friend. Uh, it's great to be on. I was just catching up uh, on some of your podcasts last night, so really good stuff. Yeah, and funny enough, we've actually been on travel, so some we've been putting out some of our older ones that hadn't actually been video shows recently. So people are like, wait, didn't the Durham report end? And I'm like, yes, that interview was done two years ago, but the Russiagate stuff is still very relevant. Um, so thank you for catching up on that. But I guess from your perspective, just so people know who you are and what you do, man, give us a little bit of uh, an introduction to yourself. Yeah, real quick. So I'm, I was born in Chicago, so I'm an American, but ethnically I'm Croatian. My parents are Croatian immigrants from Yugoslavia, and uh, I'm also a proud Croatian citizen. That's My, my name literally means Croats, uh, uh, and I, I, I grew up partially as well in Croatia, uh, studied history, education in Illinois. Uh, and then once I discovered America was an empire, I decided to expatriate permanently. Uh, my ticket out was Peace Corps Mongolia, so I lived in a yurt in the Gobi Desert for a while. Uh, was intermediate in Mongolian, and then um, did my master's in international relations at the Geneva School of Diplomacy in Switzerland. Some of my professors were uh, Saddam Hussein's defense lawyer, wow. Curtis Dobler, uh, Yasser Arafat's brother-in-law, uh, Alfred Desayas, who I've had on my podcast. He's a former UN special reporter, great-grandson of Cuba's president. Uh, and then you know, the world was my oyster, and I ended up getting a job in Mexico um, at, at the top uh, school called Tecnológico de Monterrey, which is the only university in all of Latin America that goes to Davos. It's officially affiliated with the World Economic Forum. Uh, so I taught there. And then uh, meanwhile, I had started my podcast as a way to just for intellectual stimulation. I, I, I was I, I'm naturally intro introverted. Mm. And so I was just looking to figure things out. And I was Skyping in uh, former CIA officers like Ray McGovern into my classes. Uh, and then um, I, I went off to Kazakhstan in 2017 at the Nazarbayev Intellectual School. Technically, I was employed by Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. And then COVID hit, uh, all, all heck broke loose, and I um, escaped back to, to Mexico. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's it in a nutshell, pretty much. And then I got, uh, as well, I'm doing TNT Radio. So I, I want to, I guess, first off, um, I want to talk about some of the conflicts and stuff happening. But I, I think the thing I really want to dive into you with is I, I had a conversation um, with Seth Holhouse not long ago, the, the host of Man in America. And we were talking about this idea of, of global governance. And I know this is something that, that you pay attention to a lot. And I think the thing that is confusing to a lot of people is they hear the name of various groups, you know, whether it be, you know, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, or um, which, you know, different than the Lao Beijing, but the, the CCP that runs the country. We hear about the World Economic Forum and, and people like Klaus Schwab and meeting at Davos but then if you look at the the kind of the map of things, I, I don't know, like, I feel like there should be like an Alex Jones map of the world. But if you look at the Alex Jones map of the world from 20 years ago, we had the Club of Rome and we had the Bilderberg Group and we had all these different groups. And I think it can get really confusing to people because they're like, okay, well, who is actually doing this? Is there some sort of a global threat? Like who's in control? Like what are we doing here? And I think for you, what threads do you look at or where do you start to pull? Because I think it can be very confusing to people where we actually stand. I was listening to your Richard. I've had Richard Poe on my podcast and you guys were, you, you asked him that uh, question. And uh, for me, and as you said, the, the, those are all true. You know, Bilderberg Group, uh, 1954, Trilateral Commission, 73. Um, but a lot of this stuff goes back centuries, you know, mm. millennia. You know, you had James Lindsay. I, I, I've been listening to his some of his stuff. He talks about this Gnostic sort of cult that goes back to ancient times. And even though, you know, he's an atheist, but I'd fully agree as a Christian. And uh, I take this from a Christian biblical worldview. So a lot of people, the buck stops with them at whatever group. But for me, it's like... Well, that's what I find really confusing. Like you see somebody will zone in and be like, everything is the CCP or everything is the World Economic Forum or everything is this group. And I think then you're trying to make every solution, you're trying to make every solution fit into that. And it's just, it's just not that way. 
Right. And then, you know, unfortunately, there's also people who say, and lately it's really getting annoying people who say it's the Jews, right? I do not subscribe mm -hmm. uh, to that because you've got many different interest groups in, involved. I, I view it as a class and ideological thing that these people believe in some sort of like occult thing. And for me, you know, Catherine Austin Fitz, she talks about Mr. Global. So as you mentioned, we, we know up to a point, all these, these groups that are visible, and then Mr. Global, it's just it's this big black hole. Uh, mm. But be, but for me, beyond that, it's ultimately it's 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 Satan. You know, it's it's um, I, I believe in you know as the Bible says, it's a real entity, Lucifer, that's going around doing this all the, all this stuff. And you know, when I was in Geneva, I, I attended the uh, I went uh, I went to a meeting of the L Lutz's Trust. Uh, you may have heard. Uh, so Alice Bailey, this occult uh, theosophist. Uh, Satanist founded in 1922, the Lucifer Publishing Company. They wow. renamed it to Lucifer's Trust, um, and uh, they're an official NGO affiliated with the United Nations, ECOSOC. Um, they've got a base in New York, London, and Geneva. I went to one of their meetings. So people <laughs> now can't call me some conspiracy theorist. I've actually got the pamphlet in a box here from 2009. You go to their website, they actually believe they've inverted it. They believe that Lucifer is prometheus or the light bringer um uh and, and that he is the christ the mm. messiah he is the maitreya to you know the 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 uh, those people from the eastern religions he's the mahdi for the muslims he's the christ for the christians and they say that he's actually you know they're preparing for his return so they're mm. part of the un officially um and wow. so um anyways that's for me it's like ultimately it's the devil of the bible and he's there's some mechanism i don't know how he interfaces with all the you know there's freemasonry and stuff like that but yeah you then you've got the rest of the world economic forum i've talked to people like daniel estulin you know best-selling author he's I, that was actually he was the one i was thinking of that did most of the research in the bilderberg group yeah, he's down here in um, Cancun, and I spent a day with him a couple of years back, organized a conference for him here where I am in Guadalajara, and he was telling me, you know, he was doing deep research in the archives in, in, in Italy, and there's black nobility, Venetian nobility, and I think that's closer to the mark. The real rulers are the ones we don't really see. You've got mm. this, this nobility that goes back centuries, you know, Middle Ages. Um, they own probably trillions. We don't know their names. And, mm -hmm. and there's gonna, I've got crazy stories. When I was at the Geneva School of Diplomacy, we were tra I was traveling, doing stuff. And um, I in the, inadvertently, hanging out with a friend of a friend, I ended up staying in Milan, Italy, uh, with an up-and-coming pop singer. Um, we stayed over at his house. He lived in a castle, basically, in Milan. Wow. And it wasn't obvious initially because it was urban Milan. But then as I was leaving, you can kind of see, whoa, that's like a kind of like a mini castle. And his father was the Knight of Milan of the Knights of Malta. Wow. And then though, and I, I've also visited, visited the, the, the headquarters in Rome of the Knights of Malta uh, because one of my professors uh, was a member of the Order of Malta. Those are like the groups that... You know, the, the, this is where all the the military and and, and financial wealth um, is. So yeah, you know, that, that's sort of a. And I don't I don't think it's the CCP, but uh, I've talked to people like Chris Milligan, who's the founder of Trine Day. I had him on my TNT show, which publishes a lot of these books, like Daniel Estelin's and others. And his father was in the CIA, I think, and and um, deep politics. And he, I agree with him that a lot of these networks have penetrated governments around the world. You know, Mao Zedong. Mm. I think James Lindsay has pointed this out. Mao Zedong, uh, he had some links to Yale. Uh, and so we've got this elite class in, in the main. That doesn't mean they're always on board with everything. It's like sure. cartels, like here in Mexico, cartels that they're cartels, but they battle with each other. Uh, but that's sort of my little snapshot there. <laughs> So let me let me ask you this. I'm going to ask you the, the the question my YouTube audience is always commenting on, um, and they're they're always like, "Wait, why did you interrupt the guest? They were just about to say it." Um, who controls the world, in your opinion? You know who who controls the world, in your opinion? I know that's a loaded question, but it it is the single most often asked question we're asked, and I'm always yelled at if they if uh, they think I'm interrupting the guest before they're about to spill the beans. Well, I mean, some people might not like. It. Again, I I basically say it's it's ultimately the the um, the devil, right? L Lucifer mm. is is the one. Some people don't want to hear that. They want you know they want this this group to be pointed out. That's ultimately where the buck stops for me. Uh, but then um, it's you know I'd point a lot to these. You know, the, you've got the committee of three hundred. John Col Coleman talks about. So I think there's something like that. There there's some hierarchy. World Economic Forum. 
it's, it's, it doesn't stop at World Economic Forum. Mm-hmm. That's just the visible. Well, I guess if we were to like place. look at like the pyramid of things, then like right. like who would you see? Like obviously, you know, there there's an evil force way at the top, but I guess when we're looking kind of at like the human sphere of things, right? Like you know, human actors that are here, maybe they're they're doing you know the will of the devil or, or whatever it may be. Who and who, in your opinion, is like closer to the top of the pyramid that we can actually know? Because I, in my opinion, I think the ones that are top top, you're not going to know. But I'm curious to know like. What's the highest up you think we can go on that pyramid? Yeah, a lot of my guests and yours as well, like Richard Poe, are pointing at the British Empire or its rem- remnants. Uh, you know, some of my guests, like Alex Craner, Matt Eret, um, that that does make sense. And so I, I would probably point it back to Europe, these old European, like I said, uh, this this money that goes back centuries, Middle Ages. Um, and, and again, we don't know their names. They, mm. they are the, the they are these elites that. So, um, do you mean like still like f- families people rec- would recognize? Maybe like Medici and, and right. things like that. Or is that what you're saying when you say old families? Yeah, probably. You know, the, the Rothschild family uh, most definitely the the British royalty. You know, King uh, King Charles, uh, and and then others whose names we really don't um, know because you know they're not going to be on the Forbes 500 list. Sure. So. Well, looking at that, then, um, what what do these old families want with us? You know, why 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 is there this movement for control? And and I guess what 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 in your opinion is where's it going? It's not going anywhere. Uh, <laughs> good. Uh, you know, I again, I view the the a lot of them are driven. Uh, you know, N- Nayib Bukele just tweeted yesterday, the president mm-hmm. of El Salvador, uh, mentioning how U.S. is dropping sanctions to get oil from Venezuela. And he's like, democracy is a facade. It's all about money and power. That's what Bukele mm-hmm. said yesterday on Twitter. Like, mm-hmm. we're supposed to be ideologically against the communist Venezuelans, but now we, hey, we need gas or whatever. We're going to drop the sanctions. It's, it's that's right. you know, that was a good point. Um, but, but again, the, uh, my bias is it's, it's a Christian thing, and then it, I, I meld the two worlds together, Bible and geopolitics, and try to do it, you know, factually, scientifically. And the, the driving ideology is this hate for humankind for mankind mm. there's um you know uh, they want to kill as many and the devil wants to kill as many people as possible control uh and then set up this 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 uh control system and so you've got malthusianism you know this eugenicist strain we, we're all you know we, we've seen especially the british um um boris johnson his father stanley johnson is a eugenicist. You know, he wrote this mm-hmm. book about a virus wiping people out. You can find clips of both of them on air on British television discussing how we need to reduce <laughs> massively the population. Wow. You know, Prince Philip and I, on and on it goes. Like, I don't need to, you know, you can watch Alex Jones's end games. You can find clips from them themselves. Uh, Ted Turner, right? That famous mm-hmm. interview, um, 2009, the, the, the billionaires met. Um, Wall Street Journal report, again, mainstream sources, Bill Gates, Oprah, George Soros, and others to discuss reducing the population. So basically, you know, they, they want a world government. I always talk about it. Um, it's in their white papers. I read an ac- academic report last week talking about how they want an Earth Federation. So they want to establish uh, total glo- global control. COVID was a taste of it. That was the first time in history we experienced something like that. I, I had a the Swiss millionaire who lives in Thailand, Mark Faber. Uh, and uh, on my podcast and from a secular perspective, you know, he's not Christian, but he said, this is unprecedented in history where mm-hmm. every single nation did the same thing. What well, you, you got to ask yourself. Now, that's you know, the strange part about it too, because you even look at the media clips and, and they're, they're comical. I, I don't know if you've seen some of the media clips where, um, you know, they're repeating the exact same thing. Like the one that comes to mind is, um, it's a threat to our democracy and they're all saying the exact same thing. And it's, to me, it's, it's strange to see this level of coordination at a local level, at a national level and at a global level. It's, 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 it's really weird. Nations are always fighting with each other. So when you, when you say they all agreed, something is not right here, right? doesn't make mm-hmm. no one ever, no pol- the politicians don't always, uh, agree. So, you know, I would say they want to set up a world government. We are right in, you know, we're, we're already in it. You know, mm-hmm. we're already in it. The EU is the technocratic blueprint um, for that. I've been pointing out how last year, even my president, because I'm also a Mexican citizen, uh, Amlo Lopez Operador, he specifically said recently, we want to integrate Canada, USA, and Mexico based on the EU. Mm. Bukele, as much as people like Bukele in July, he said, we want to integrate Central America, no borders, 
based on the EU, he said specifically. And then wow. you had the f- former president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, say earlier, also the same thing, that we want to r- replicate the EU in South America. So have mm-hmm. one political union, one currency. That is the model for world um, government. So they want that total control, and then they want to establish this digital you know, cashless system so then they can, you know, manage us. Um, and then, you know, reducing the population through different means, you know, um, mm-hmm. wars that are going on now, uh, the Slavs killing each other, Ukraine and Russia. Um, they don't care about either side. Uh, the middle class is eroding. That's part of the Great Reset Project. You see it everywhere now. Inflation is just eroding the middle class here in Mexico, in America, uh, Europe. Uh, and then, you know, if, and through uh, disease, right? Biological mm-hmm. A warfare and, and and whatnot. So that, that's sort of how I see <laughs> things. Well, I guess there, then there's kind of two layers of things I I, I want to look at. Um, and, and it's really interesting. Um, I think last week we just replayed an episode that we recorded in 2020, and it had actually it actually never aired um, on the video podcast. And that's the interview with John Perkins of uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Um, so I think it kind of fits well with with where we're located, you and I, at the moment in, in this conversation. So I guess when we're looking at it, um, where does kind of the there, there's there's two layers of things. There's this global governance layer, and there's also the multinational corporation layer. And I guess when we look at that, which one of those do you think is a bigger problem? Like I, I'm, they're both a problem, but which one do you think is a bigger problem in terms of like having more control of the other? I think they're both interlinked because basically our nations are owned by corporations now mm. because it's these same corporations. You look at the list uh, of the annual list of the Bilderberg, um, you know, the steering committee that they, they publish now the list, that you, you know, by the way, you can go to public intelligence or WikiLeaks and find all of the Bilderberg uh, meeting notes, you know, going back to the fifties mm. and then you can see, a lot you got a lot of board members from these big multinationals and so i've had guests on like professor william robinson who's who's, who's great and others and he's a leftist uh, and he's pointing out it's it's this transnational class now that's why mm. you see in russia you see you know hermann graf spare bank right the russian spare bank is full steam ahead pushing uh, QR code, vaccine passports, and and uh, they opened up a fourth industrial revolution center in Moscow, and uh, he's you know he's working with cy- the cyber polygon with Klaus Schwab, and and so uh, th- you know that's why in China, for example, I had on a great guest, Peruvian professor Miklos Lucas, who talked about in the '90s, uh, you know Bill Gates opened up his AI center in Microsoft in the early '90s, and he was pointing out how Hu Jintao, the, the then Chinese president. When he had gone to visit the U.S., usually diplomatically, the president's going to stop at Washington first, right? Mm. No, his first visit was to Microsoft in Seattle with Bill Gates. Uh, and so that, you know, that shows you the penetration of these companies. And, that, you know, in many ways, China is the technocratic laboratory for the world. But again, I don't think it's Xi Jinping is he's not driving it. It's not Xi Jinping saying, I want to take over the world. He's participating mm. in this um system as are the others but then naturally you have um frictions you know maybe within china maybe within the russian um government maybe not not everyone is fully uh on board but um yeah i I would see that the corporations are largely uh, the big ones uh, on on board with look look at where i used to teach detective on today we Mm -hmm. would have al gore visited uh while i was teaching our campus uh, during the COVID online graduations, you had Hillary Clinton uh, speak, and um, was it Bill Gates uh, at at the university? And it's my school's a, it's a corporation. It's owned so, by by FEMSA, which is linked to World Economic Forum. Uh, and and just w- one more thing, we've got these yeah. things called OXO, which are like the Seven Elevens in Mexico. They're everywhere on every corner, and the OXO uh, on the campus of the Tech Team on today. They're prototyping the first cashless OXO on that campus, which is, again, it's linked to World Economic Forum. It's you scan your, your, your QR code, you come in, take whatever you want, and then you leave. And then they're saying they want to replicate it in the rest of uh, Mexico. So that you can see that link between corporations and then the you know, World Economic Forum and world government. So let me ask you this then. Um, do these conflicts that are happening now, do these just fit in with this is what the corporations want? Um, there was a really interesting meme I saw on Twitter. Um, and it's the, the guy, he has a stick and he's poking the American flag 
and it says, come on, do war. And behind him is like Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and like all these like, you know, multinational military industrial complex com companies. So is that who's pushing these conflicts then? Because they're like, hey, it's just time to make money or, you know, because the countries could also be pushing this because that brings us the, the, the less money countries have, the more they come to being this, you know, kind of united society. So I guess when you look at it, which one of those threads seems more correct to you or is it one I'm missing? I, I think it could be all of, all of the above. Uh, you, I mean, you do have genuine, um, you know, nationalist interests, civilizational interests, right? You think about Russia, uh, you know, irredentism. You see what's happening with uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia and, and the, the territories that have been uh, unresolved for, for a, a long time. Um, it, it is a case for making money. You know, you hear all this talk about BlackRock uh, coming in to rebuild. You know, when Iraq was blown to pieces, you had Halliburton and Bechtel coming in, charging $600 uh, toilet, charging American <laughs> taxpayers $600 is for toilet seats in in uh wow. Iraq, Iraq um total scam but uh yeah part of it's to make money and i think what you said to impoverish the nations it it's depopulation the war is killing it's impoverishing people uh it's causing disease so you 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 check off a lot of things and then they will rebuild the nations back in a more technocratic system look look at what mm -hmm. they're talking about for ukraine you know um well ukraine we already have blackrock is already like signed in for the rebuild yeah, and they want to they want to build in smart cities. Uh, they're using this digital app called Dia. Uh, I think yeah, you know, Financial Times reported this week the Japanese Prime Minister held a meeting with BlackRock, Blackstone, and everyone else, and he's basically saying, "Welcome, you know, come come <laughs> come and take take us over." Basically, you know, rape Japan. Uh, he's selling the, the the nation of Japan, giving into the hands of Larry Fink. Uh, and he, that guy's nuts. You know, he's, he's said things, you can find clips of him saying, we, we like totalitarianism. It's good. It's, it makes it mm -hmm. easier to, to run. He actually said, you know, something I'm paraphrasing, but he said something to that tune. And so, um, and then, you know, I use the example of my other homeland, Croatia, you know, we were part of Yugoslavia, right? Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, Macedonia. And we were in, uh, relatively, you know, we could have been Early on, a more formidable force, we were independent, not with the Soviets, not with the Americans. Uh, you know, things did start to go downhill, but, you know, the empire wants to break everything into pieces. Mm. So they broke us up. And, of course, it was a mix of foreign interests and then the organic animosity between Croats, Serbs, um, you know, Orthodox, Muslim, um, Catholic, whatever. But what, what happened as a result? We were broken into pieces, little republics, and then reintegrated into the European Union. And so I kind mm. of see a similar thing, you know, Richard Poe was talking about that in America, North America, you've got this Christian nationalist movement, you've got this flooding of migrants, uh, Colonel McGregor, uh, who we've both uh, interviewed, uh, he was tweeting yesterday that we're wa watching the disintegration of America. The only way they can do that is through mass uh, migration, because I think that's going to create some sort of social upheaval, some sort of civil war-like situation in, in North America. And then again, what's the solution? North American Union, right? Let's integrate. Well, you look at Canada. you look at what even happened to to Europe, right? Like um, Europe's had migration problems with you know the Middle East and Northern Africa and things like that for years. And you you um, you know you're on the streets of Rome, and there there's people selling things all over the place. Or um, I, I my my wife back when she was still in high school, she had went to to Paris on a school trip, and some gypsies tried to like steal her friend. Like th this it's become a problem for there for so long. You look at um, a lot of those countries have lost national identity. And I think we've been made to believe that having national identity is a bad thing. And I, it's not a bad thing. It's something to have pride in. It's something to, to care about. It's, it's what makes us who we are because if we have national identity, well, what's the point in having a nation, man? I, I have three national identities and I'm very proud of all of them. You know, I'm proud to be a, a, a Mexican. Some people laugh at it that, that I know. And I'm like, hey, what about the, you know, all the foreigners that come to America, they get American citizenship. Like I'm American. Well, hey, I did the same thing in Mexico. So I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm also uh, proud. And as you say, when you, ha you have invested interest in your nation, if, if you're hmm. proud of your nation, um, you know, there's a difference between patriotism um, and, you know, maybe nationalism, but you have this feeling of, of, of love and caring, and then you want to fight for your nation. You want to see it do well. 
And the, you know, the, the, that's the whole point of what they're doing. They want to destroy the nation. It's it's Babylon. You go back to Babylon. It's multiculturalism. It's it's Babylon, uh, and that's the EU project. So we have mm-hmm. no no families, no tradition, no traditional values. Uh, you know, it's it's the the rainbow fascist flag, as my former guest Jim Jatris calls it. Um, <laughs> and so the, this you know transgender uh, ideology. You know, and, and you have the State Department financing this there's mm-hmm. I, you know in ecuador they sent tens of thousands to promote drag queen events uh they're i just remember the most recent report in the middle east in egypt and elsewhere they're sending money to promote gender st- studies and marxism outright mm-hmm. it was the official reports at marxism and so um yeah and so eu is having problems but you know um there's also been talk that the, the eu themselves saying it might collapse but then that you know they might also have a contingency plan to um remake it again you know how mm-hmm. you're in a laboratory you make something it fails and right. then you learn learn from that and so the, the, i i haven't well, been that's able how to... we got the un right they tried the league of nations it didn't work out so good you know um wilson had a stroke and they, they tried the the uh the un later on right exactly there's this you know white paper uh very academic white paper i found i can't i gotta find it again i don't i don't know the name i lost the bookmark but it was talking about how in 2030 2035 the eu would disintegrate but then I think it was alluding to how, and a lot of people are pointing that out. I've had, you know, French intellectuals, Thierry Maison and uh, Guy Maton, Swiss journalist on, they were both saying the consequence of the Ukraine war is Europe is, is finished, it's disintegrating. Mm-hmm. Um, but they could then just remake, you know, EU 2.0. Uh, you know, maybe part of the Ukraine thing is that there's been talk of this old Lithuanian Polish union you know you've got mm-hmm. the the three c's initiative up there so they might be thinking okay this eu is too big maybe we're going to have two parts of the eu this this baltic union and then the western eu pashinyan the prime minister of armenia yesterday he was at the eu or the day before saying hey you know we'd be happy to armenia to integrate with um eu so you know a lot of a lot of a lot, a lot of stuff is going on in the globalist uh, kitchen you know <laughs> well i guess getting back to the to the conflicts we have at the moment you know we have um, the conflict that always seems to be there and always seems to kick back up, which is the the Israel Palestine conflict, and and I see it as difficult both ways, right? Because if you look at it, you know it's it's been historically the Jewish homeland, but then for a long period of time they weren't there, right? And then you know have you have the early 1900s that the British take it over and um, they have the the British mandate where the Palestinians are living, and then after World War II they they make it a Jewish homeland again, but there were kind of still already people living there. And so it's tough because like Israel should exist, but at the same time, like, I feel like the Palestinians should exist. But if you also look at the Palestinians on like kind of the level of, um, and somebody out there on YouTube is going to yell at me for this, but you, if you look at them on the level of other, um, other countries, um, in the middle East, they're seen as one of the lower level, like, you know, Iran and these other countries actually look down on the Palestinians. Right. So it's, but it's like, well, at least they're not Israel. And so it's, I look at that conflict and I don't see how that one is ever going to resolve, right? Like they both call the same place home, you know, somebody wants to control it. One of them does. So it's, you know, going to, could that be the next forever war now? Because we look at, we, we, we lost Afghanistan. So we, we don't have that anymore to throw money at. And the thing I think is interesting as well is if you look at even, I think it was like 19,000 troops that are already, you know, U S troops that are stationed there that could take action. And you have to think about like preparation goes into that, right? Like they were thinking about this a long time ago before those troops got there. So is this the next place that we just spend money forever because it's a war that nobody can win? I think it's the original uh, forever war. I I, I do not think it will be resolved. Again, I come at this from a biblical view and a lot of us have been expecting this and it's here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people can't just dismiss uh, well, if you if you look at everything, you know, biblically too, like, you know, Har Megiddo is where they say, you know, Armageddon is going to happen. So you could look at it from that perspective, too. Yeah. And and um, I can go back. I did a great interview three years ago with uh, Dr. Francis Boyle, the author of the Biological Weapons Act. Um, mm-hmm. And he's also an expert in, in the Middle East stuff. He worked closely with the Palestinian um with the Palestinians to, to formulate the the in the 90s, I think, the or late 80s, 90s, the, the peace plans. And one thing, you know, he he sort of predicted this three years ago. He made the point that, you know, the American empire is the biggest empire. And I was making this point as well. It's the biggest empire in the history of the world. 
Yes. Right? Look at all the thousand, you know, you got officially what, 800 military bases, but then you got these special ops. Rome, officer- Rome collapsed long before uh, they got to this, this extent. Yeah. Yeah. And then all the military, you know, just, yeah, as you say, the extents of, of, you know, the full spectrum dominance, all that. And he says that he calls it unlimited imperialism. You know, he studied under, I think he had Kissinger's office, uh, Boyle, uh, and he studied under one of those famous academics. I can't remember, sure. but um, unlimited imperialism, it's going to keep going until it collapses or it's forced to stop. And, you know, that's been the project of the Western, you know, the Brussels, London, Washington empire. They want the unipolar global government um and the end goals are russia china and iran uh and so one thing that in, i see russia china iran is in what is in like a like a access of, uh, between them or to, to take or, them over because you it, see okay. you know you had uh, wesley clark in 2001 admit yeah oh we, yeah the, we, the west clark seven yeah yeah, and so um, all of the outliers, the, the the ones that are not integrating um, uh, into, I'm forgetting his name now. Another guy who talks about the non-integrating gap, um, but uh, there's this map of you know your countries like Venezuela and and, and Syria who don't want to be fully on board, and Yemen and Libya, and then Russia, China, North Korea, mm-hmm. and the, the the big ones are Iran. You know, if you look at it economically, militarily, Iran, Russia, and China. So. Sure. Uh, they've said they want to openly dismember, decolonize uh, Russia, um, China, and then uh, Iran. So I think we might be seeing possibly th- this could be the beginning stages of war with Iran, um, mm. which would then, I mean, if that happens, then it's like, I think it'd be like World War Three, basically. Mm. And then uh, a lot of people that I'm talking to on, on both my programs, you know, Gerald Salente yesterday tweets out, um, I've got the tweet here. He says, as I've said, World War Three is on. It will only become official after the first nuke strike. And so, yeah. so many people that I'm talking to are saying, you know, it looks like World War Three. And so, well, yeah, even I, um, I know this is kind of taking a leap, but even, you know, if you look at Nostradamus, um, I remember watching this Nostradamus HBO special as when I was a kid. I had nightmares for a little bit from it, too. Um, but you know, there was like a, a world war that would be predicted to come from the Middle East and we haven't exactly had one of those yet. Um, and so I don't know how much stock you put in those things, but that's also another thing that points to that. You know, in some ways it does seem, uh, inevitable, but again, um, they, you, you've also, you know, the council on foreign relations, I think it was 2006, I can't recall. They published a, a piece, um, how they wanted to create a Middle Eastern, uh, union. So again, mm. they they want to create these regional unions. You do that through wars or civil wars, or uh, you know how the EU was created out of a, a, a World War. Um, so again, th- that's that's something to keep in the back of the uh, mind. Maybe afterwards they would try to create you know the the Middle Eastern Union as the CFR um, talks about. But I don't think this conflict will ever be resolved. And again, a lot of the prophecies prophecies like in Deuteronomy elsewhere talk about how Jerusalem is going to be this um, cup of, of, of like trembling, you know, Mm. anyone who touches it is going to have their hand cut uh, on this stone. Like it's just, it's unresolvable. Then you've got the whole thing about, you know, some guy comes on the scene, antichrist and stuff like that. And then all, uh, all heck breaks, breaks loose, you know, and, um, it it just seems like we're entering in that moment. I could be wrong. You know, maybe it's not now and maybe I I, I could say we felt like that many times in history, but I also can, can see what you're saying about, you know, how things feel now. And I, and I guess bringing, bringing the Ukraine conflict into it, is it just kind of over and nobody noticed or, you know what I mean? Cause there's like all these conflicts happening in the background. I'm just waiting for, for Taiwan to pop off now. Like, is is Ukraine kind of over and is like Taiwan on deck? It's 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 so interesting, man, because it feels like like we're really tumultuous, like globally at the moment. Like it could pop off anywhere. We look at Kosovo is bubbling up again. Um, so is is Ukraine just over now and and people just forgot about it? I, I don't think so. I think they're all connected. If you look geopolitically, then it comes back to the empire again and what they okay. want and what they're doing. And again, it's not just me. A lot of my, I was looking at Alexander Dugin, right? Um, the other day he he uh, tweeted, I think I pull up the quote real quick. He, he tweets, he says, 
it appears Ukraine was just a preface for something much bigger. New front mm. lines manifest themselves on much broader scale. Alex Craner, who I've had on, he's a fellow Croatian, also speaks Spanish because he was in Venezuela and he served in the Croatian army. He's out in Monaco, former hedge fund manager. He said six months ago that, well, so what we're seeing, these are not isolated conflicts. That mm -hmm. Israel-Palestine is just a new front that has mm -hmm. opened in the same global war. So okay. Ukraine... Um, you know, Nagorno Karabakh. Um, it's I, all part I of the could same. I see that. That makes a lot of sense because I think the people, the thing people don't think of is, it wasn't just like, all right, guys, World War II is starting. Let's get all those fronts. It is, you know, you do start to see fronts pop up all over the place, right? Like you even look at the the Civil War in America, right? Like people didn't expect when that first battle happened that it was a front on a war, and I I think. The, the interesting thing about this is we haven't lived through this with something like the internet or social media. So we're actually experiencing it differently than people would have before. Yeah. And then I call it the hundred year storm. You know, we're in a scenario where it's the, you know, great depression 2.0 economic collapse. You know, a great guest you should have on Gregory Copley, who I've interviewed many times, head of the international strategic studies association um, you know, he says we're in the age, there's no more democracy. It's a, democracy is finished. We are definitively in the age of authoritarianism and tyranny. Mm. You see it in the West all over now. Democracy is gone. In the West, we are now entering into an age of tyranny. Look what's happening in Canada, the U.S. They're legalizing now thought crime, um, domestic terror, all this crazy stuff in Europe. Uh, and so that's that 100-year storm, like the 1930s. You saw the rise in the 1930s. Economic collapse. Uh, cultural degeneration, the rise of tyranny and war. And it feels like, you know, here we are exactly a century uh, later. I call it, again, the hundred year storm, World War One, World War Two scenario. And then this is what happens. Uh, then all these, then, you know, uh, Azerbaijan sees, you know, everyone's distracted in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. they, that's their moment to go for Nagorno like, Karabakh or for China to go for uh, Taiwan. And so, and then th there's a power vacuum, right? The, the, yeah. the, the rules based order is crumbling and there's the, the America can't be the policeman anymore. And they're like, Hey, the police are not here. We can go, <laughs> you know, we can go, we can go loot. You know, yeah. it's, it's like, it's like New Orleans after Katrina then. Exactly. So yeah, it's that, that's how I feel, you know? And well, yeah. Well, let me, let me ask you this then, because I think, you know, this, it can sound scary. It can sound a little bit threatening and what we try to do with people here is, is show them like, you know, Hey, something can be done about it. Like they're, you're not powerless They're you know, the world is not going to crush you. So I guess from your viewpoint to individual people listening, you know, what can they do to feel a little bit more causative or what can they do to feel like, you know, this thing isn't crushing them? Yeah. You know, um, I look at this stuff daily and, you know, maybe because I'm Croatian, we, we have a dark sense of humor and, um, you know, I, I like to live in reality and, you know, this mm -hmm. stuff doesn't get me um down okay sometimes it does but you know generally day every day i'm, I'm chipper i'm happy you sure. have to you can't spend all your time online digesting this stuff you know mm -hmm. just like everything do it in a measured fashion so stay up to date with stuff but then you know go live your life be with ha make babies you know have <laughs> get married have have a family hang out with friends go out in nature you know look at art uh so you know ha have a balance um you know the my faith keeps me going. Um, and, you know, I, I look at my own history. I've been told my great grandfather died as a result of World War One. Um, mm. They say that uh, the war was over. But in his region, the fighting kept going on because, you know, they didn't have what's up to get the update. And <laughs> yeah. uh, a bomb fell into his courtyard up there in northern or southern Croatia. I don't remember where it was. My grandfather, who I knew very well, um, he was a prisoner of the Croatian Nazi regime for six mm. months held in a hole uh and he survived and my uncle fought in the yugoslav war and so every generation we have to face you know um uh ur fascism i'm forgetting his name now the italian um philosopher uh I've slipped my mind um but he called every the eternal fascism every you know generation we have to fight with this tyranny and so it's just a normal it's a normal thing um but like i said you know find uh i have my faith people find other things um and you know live your life in a balanced way. And th there are people setting up communities uh, as well. I you know, see here in Mexico, I've had on my podcast, people, you know, there's communities in Panama, in mm -hmm. Uruguay, in the US, in Europe, in Asia, uh, you know, find like-minded 
people, but uh, I, I do. I've got listeners who send me emails and say every day they're, they're like literally freaking out. They're like, well, that, and that's the point I'm making is I think like people can get so consumed by this that you know they're 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 not working, they're not creating, they're not doing these different things. They think there's, um, you know, something behind every rock. And I think the thing you have to understand is, you know, do these things exist? Absolutely. Is there difficulty out there? Absolutely. But you have to live your life, man. Like you have to live your life because, you know, it's, you got to try and make the, the plan a little bit better for future generations, but you have to live your life. Exactly. You know, there's, there's people who tell me, and, and they're worrying about this on a daily basis. They're like, the, the 5G is going to fry us and, and then, you know, uh, stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I get it. I, I have an EMF meter, you know, I, I, that stuff is bad. I, I do things to mitigate it, but yeah. it's not as bad as you, you, you're exaggerating, you know, the, sure. the threat and, you know, every generation has had, people have dealt with worse stuff, you know, and, and mm -hmm. what, what the horrors of the Soviet regime and the Nazi regime and Mussolini's regime and, you know, what happened to Armenians or Middle Ages, people, Inquisition, people getting flayed. Uh, I, I forget where it was. I was in a travel somewhere in the past years. I, I think I actually saw, um, was it like an Iron Maiden or, or one of those tor medieval, medieval torture devices? I think that was when I went to Russia. They had like wow. an actual medieval torture device. I mean, imagine going through that. You know, we're, it's not things aren't that bad. And, and hey, maybe it will touch you. You know, I'm here in Mexico. Uh, I've, you know, I remember years ago, a half hour from where I am, I mean, they still find houses with barrels of acid where human bodies are dissolved half hour from where I live, you know, sure. but I'm not going to live fearing, hey, it might happen to me. I got my faith to deal with that. But life goes on, you know, it's just in, 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 enjoy life. And, you know, this is what it's like to be be human, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, and I kind of don't. I also like having my metal tested, you know, when it comes to mm -hmm. all these different, different difficulties, you know, I've got a, the art of manliness, Rudyard Kipling poem right here in front of me, which talks about, you know, if, if you, uh, you, you take all of your winnings and you risk it all on the one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss, you know, you're, you're, you're mad. And I, mm -hmm. I like that attitude of grit, uh, and testing your metal. You know, my grandpa was a prisoner of the Nazis for six months and he survived. And that's hardcore. You know, yeah. that, that, that's, you know, that's that's what keeps me going. Well, I, I do think your next round of uh, geopolitics and empire T-shirts um, should have your face on them and say, make babies. I think that is the, the next <laughs> the next round of the next round of merch for you guys. But I, I appreciate you, you being here today. Um, so for people that want to find out more about you and, and what you're doing, um, you know, where should they go, man? I was just going to say Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates will not be happy uh, with people making uh, babies. But yeah, just geopoliticsandempire.com. Uh, and then I'm active on Twitter and my Telegram Telegram chat there. People can join and find me out. You know, I'm on all the other alternate socials, Gap, Getter, all that. And then TNT Radio live. We're going to go soon to video. And then there's an, people can call into the show, talk to the guests. Oh. You know, I had James Corbett on uh, this week and you know, all yourself and, and, um, uh, so yeah. Well, Hervoye Morich, thank you uh, so much for being on today, my friend. It was uh, great. Thanks.